Okay, cool. So, first question. Have a go at this. You've all probably read this already, so you can answer quite quickly. This is the most people I've ever had logged on to Menti. I am quite impressed. Fine, you can have another, how long? 10 seconds. Cool. Um, yeah, so basically you were split between B and C. Um, the correct answer is B. So just to go through the other options. Oh, wait, before we do that, what, what is the most likely diagnosis? Yeah, it's li it's likely PCP. Um, out of the options that are given here, it's 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 quite yeah. It could be COVID. I was going to say desaturating on walking is quite COVID, isn't it? Um, so option one would cover like TB if they're coughing up some sputum. Option two is um, is uh, PCP. Option three. So do you, do you know what you use India ink staining for? Uh, mainly, it's like another AIDS related like infection. Yeah, cryptococcus neoformans in the CSF, or I think you can also use it for cryptosporidiosis in, in the GI tract. You can use it for both. Crypto basically means you can't really culture it, so you need to stain it with Indian. It doesn't really grow very well uh, on culture. Uh, blood culture, yeah, quite good. Um, if you're thinking like a form of sepsis, uh, CT, chest, abdo, pelvis is just um, a bit of a like excessive investigation at this stage. Um, so just to follow on, this is exactly the same vignette, but the question is slightly different. So wait, let me open voting. We set. Have a go at this one. Oh, sorry. Yeah, um, you can have a, uh, you can answer on the menti. If you've just joined, I'll post the code again. I had a feeling this would split the vote a little bit. Although everyone is backing your option, so maybe not your bad. Uh, you can have another 10 seconds. OK, so a few of you went for B, a few of you went for C, a lot of you went for D. D is the correct answer. Um, so there is some clinical relevance to this question. Um, so just to summarize, pneumocystis gyrovecci is like a fungal pneumonia. It's most common in patients with a CD4 count of below 200. If they have a CD4 count of below 200, you need to give them prophylaxis. Um, so you, you, we're taught it largely in the context of uh, AIDS, but it's important to remember that patients who are post transplant are on and are on like calcineurin inhibitors can get like pneumocystis as well. Um, so it's called pneumocystis because it causes like these classical cysts in the lungs. There's the one that the arrow is pointing to. 
Um, there's some smaller ones in like the right middle to upper zone as well. If you can probably spot them, you, you, you likely won't get this obvious and large assist in your exam. This is like very obvious. Um, and in addition to that, they also have like bilateral infiltrates. Like it looks quite cloudy on both sides, um, if I can convince you of that. So those are like the key findings on x-ray. Uh, sorry, what was the answer to the SBA? And so the answer was D. It was the PAO2 of 7. So, yeah, diagnosis, you get bilateral infiltrates and cysts. And then as, as, as like the majority of you got correct, you do like a bronchoalveolar lavage. So you put some earth fluid down there, take it out, and then you can silver stain the fluid you've got out with the silver stain, and you'll get these classical cysts, um, of which I have forgotten to put a photo, so I'm going to find a photo really quickly. Um, cysts, new cysts. Um, so does, uh, so why, why do we have to lavage them? Why can't you just get sputum? It's, it's kind of like, it's a bit of a commonsensical question, but like, why is that for anyone who's not done? Yeah, so it's like a dry cough. They don't cough any up any sputum, so you can't just silver stain the sputum. Fine. Uh, give me just a second. So this is what it will look like on staining usually, or it will look a bit more red. So this is another really, you see these like classical cysts. Um, so do you know how you treat this condition? Yeah, cotrimoxazole and yeah, methylprednisolone is relevant if they're if they're hypoxic. Um, the guidelines kind of like I don't think there's actually like set guidelines on like the level, but like for exams, I think it's actually like a like a O2 of like less than uh, 9.3. Um, what two drugs is cotrimoxazole made out of? James is not allowed to answer this question. Yeah, it, 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 yeah, trimethoprim and sulfamethoxazole. So remember that you can't give it with other folate antagonists. So um, just be aware of that. Um, that's like a common, that's like an interaction that is missed by a lot of GPs because they don't realize um, uh, there's uh, trimethoprim in it. Uh, cool. So yeah, if it's severe, the other option is like IV pentamidine. Uh, you add that on to the cotrimoxazole. That's like a consultant level decision, so I wouldn't really worry too much uh, too much about when you give that. But steroids, if they've got like a low PaO2, is important. The the prophylaxis is also cotrimoxazole as well. Um, so it's just one drug you have to remember for both um things. Cool. Next question. So a slightly related note. What is this? I'm fairly sure I've shown you this image before. Uh, what is the harm with uh, cause uh, we're giving just another drug, which is also an antifolate? So if you if you combine antifolates, you tend to get like some you tend to get marrow suppression. So it's it's usually a bit unsafe. It's that's why you don't tend to combine trimethoprim and methotrexate. It's like the same thing. You just wouldn't give something like methotrexate. Just be wary of the interaction. Obviously, like in real life, you're going to check the interactions in the BNF or um, whatever online system you're using. Yeah, uh, yeah. There's a Kaposi sarcoma. So there's two types of Kaposi sarcoma. Does anyone know what like the two types are? And there's one you need to know a lot about, and one you don't really need to know anything about. I say a lot. It's, I guess it's still not a lot. Um, so effectively, there's there's a form that that has like a strong 
Yeah, so you can you can I guess you can combine it into cutaneous only versus visceral, but like in the context of AIDS, often like it can be visceral as well, and they can have GI involvement, which can cause like major GI hemorrhage. Um, yeah, that's really important to think of. Is it affecting like the inside of the body as well as well as the skin? Because it is like um, it's basically like a cancer. Like the best way to think of it is it's like a cancer of the connective tissue within like the blood vessel walls which is why like they're they're prone to bleeding and like gi bleeds um but effectively there's the epidemic kaposi sarcoma which is the one you need to know about which is associated with aids but there's also like a like classical one that was seen before like the 1960s um in like mediterranean population which has some like genetic um uh factors affecting whether or not like uh, people get it uh, but yeah, the important one is the AIDS-associated one. And how do you treat it? How do you treat Kaposi's sarcoma in the context of AIDS? I only learned this like a month before my exams because someone asked me, I was like, wait, I don't know the answer to this. Yeah, yeah, you just you just treat the um you you just give combined antiretroviral therapy and that that will sort out the capacities as well. Uh, what's a causative virus? Yeah, HHV8, great, good stuff. Um, fine, bit of a tangent. Uh, I have shown you this image before, but this is good revision because like I think this is an important condition for your five. Yeah, this is classical plaque psoriasis, and what's like the what's like the mainstay of treatment for plaque psoriasis? There is obviously the steroid ladder that you can remind us about in a minute, but yeah, topical vitamin D analogs like calcipatriol and then steroids is like the mainstay of treatment. Um, it's mainly on the extensor surfaces if it if in kids it's rare but if it happens in kids it's sometimes on the flexors uh remember i can't remember i gave like you I, I think i gave you guys like a good mnemonic for remembering the strengths of like steroids but it was so good that i think i've forgotten it yeah you can use emollients as well because it is quite itchy um and it's quite it can be quite flaky so emollients can help a lot Oh yeah, health everybody dermatologist. So it's like um, I can't remember the actual steroid's name. Something Umavate, Vetnavate, Dermavate. That's like the order of potency. Oh yes, hydrocortisone is the weakest steroid. I mean, my mind's gone to mush after finals. Clearly, um, if anyone sees Severa at UCH, you can thank her for that mnemonic. Um, so just to just briefly um systemic again i've shown you this slide before but there's a few like important things if you've got erythroderma you give if you've got psoriatic arthritis if you've got postular involvement you need to give some slightly different drugs erythroderma isn't an important thing to like it's an important thing to be aware of but like they, they tend to get cyclosporin which is like this which is a calcineurin inhibitor, which is like a really strong immunosuppressant. Uh, do you know what you use for methotrexate? Whoops. Uh, sorry, I asked the wrong question. I'm tired. Yeah, so psoriatic, you give methotrexate because you're basically treating it as rheumatoid. Um, so if you've got postular psoriasis, you can treat it a bit like acne. It's a drug that sounds like something you would use for acne. Any ideas? So it's it's like a vitamin A analog esque thing. It's called acetretin. Um, I you don't need to know more about it than that. And then you can use the same biologicals as you can for rheumatism, which is like infliximab or stikinumab. Um, so if they get like a if they start getting lots of plaques over a very short period of time, which has happened to one of my friends, like they are at like a risk of erythroderma and. Erythroderma is effectively like redness covering like a, like a vast majority of like 
your skin. So if they if it's spreading rapidly and you think that they're going to reach the stage of erythroderma, you can um, you can give them cyclosporin to calm it down because sometimes they won't just respond to the steroids. Basically, if it's rapidly spreading psoriasis that's leading to like coverage of most of the body, you give them cyclosporin. It's like one of the few like I wouldn't I wouldn't go as far as calling it a dermatological emergency, but like you do want to get on top of it quickly if it's spreading a lot. Um, yeah does that make sense if it's spreading a lot and it's spreading quickly you want to try you consider giving like cyclosporin it that is a, like i wouldn't worry too much about that because that is like if someone's getting erythroderma that is definitely like a consultant level decision not like a junior doctor decision so unless you're planning to do dermatology um which it will still be a few years away i wouldn't worry too much about when you would give it uh cool Right. This is the last thing I have before I hand over to Jess. So what is so oh, I'll give you a vignette. This is a slightly pre this is a preterm baby born at like 30 weeks. Yeah, so R this is RDS. Why is it RDS? What's like the characteristic, a characteristic finding on this like chest X-ray? Yeah, ground glass shadowing in both like of the lung fields. This is one of like the few things on like a chest X-ray where I can confidently call it ground glass because I like usually gr like ground glass tends to be more like a CT description. But like in this case, it does genuinely look like ground glass. Um, so yeah, that is the key finding. And wh what is the issue? Why does this happen to like a preterm babies? I'll get onto that question in a minute. Why does this happen? What's like the physiology of this? Lack of surfactant. Yeah, so the other, so like the main thing is like the lack of surfactant, which effectively means that like the alveoli can't really compress, they're inflated and then they can't really compress back properly because that's kind of the role of surfactant. Uh, surfactant is produced later on birth, yeah. And do you know what kind of cells surfactant is produced? This is like some, like, this is like the only niche thing that you kind of I, I would learn do you know what type of cell produces yeah type 2 pneumocytes so and what do you give to prevent this from happening if you're expecting a preterm birth obviously if it's an emergency something like this is not uncommon because this might happen yeah you give you give the mother steroids which will hopefully go across and cause like surfactant to be produced in, in, in the baby. Yeah. So how does this differ from chronic lung disease or, or bronchopulmonary dysplasia? Uh, I'm going to just try and find a picture of bronchopulmonary dysplasia. So this is a picture of that. The important changes are basically the cystic changes rather than ground glass changes, if I can convince you of that. And often you'll get a hyper, you, you, you will find a hyper expanded lung in uh, chronic lung disease because um, of the ventilator scarring, they're, they're more likely to have to hyper inflate their lungs. Uh, and you might also find uh, like some basal atelectasis, but I find that quite hard to see on like a um, chest x-ray. But if you can see it, that that's not like the best image. But the cystic changes are probably like the thing that I look for if it's um, bronchopulmonary dysplasia. It's, I, they're like, do, do kids recover from bronchopulmonary dysplasia, by the way? Yeah, that, that's a good question. It's like, it kind of depends. Like, they, it can have like long-term sequelae, but 
I'm not actually sure. I think like a, I think a fair few do get better. Jess, what do you know about bronchopulmonary dysplasia? Sorry, my peds isn't like the hottest. I think like in childhood, it's like quite challenging, but they need to be managed appropriately. It, and um, it tends to get a bit better over time, but they still have like some of the scarring, which is permanent. I think, as Anita said, it tends to get better as the kid gets older. Yeah. Um, but unless it's very severe, the kid can still have issues. Um, but generally it gets better as, as they get older and the lungs like continue to mature. Yeah, I think like a small subset of babies who have really severe version, like a severe version of this, like sometimes require like lung transplantation. But I, like, I think that's like quite niche. And like, I don't like, I don't know what percent that is, but it should get better over time. Usually um, the kid just goes home like on oxygen if they really need it. Um, yeah. And then eventually you just wean them off. And most yeah. of the child time they're fine. So, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Um, quickly, everything we just talked about. Oh, yeah. What do you do to treat like a, an infant who's already born with like surfactant deficiency? Yeah, which I think is like, so, yeah, it's endotracheal surfactant, which I think is such a strange thing. Just putting surfactant down the ET tube. I assume it's like sterile. Um, so yeah, that's basically the management. Um, there is a role for CPAP as well, um, but it's been, the, the, the priority is intubation and oxidation, oxid, uh, oxygenation uh, followed by surfactant replacement. Cool. Uh, Jess has taken control. I'll hand over to her. Any questions, I'll be around. So just, yeah, pop them in the chat. Yeah, sorry, Jess, I, your slides aren't combined because I didn't have time. I got home quite late. I also didn't have time, Anish. Um, uh, do you wait until chest x-ray to endotracheal tube? That's a good question. I think... Hmm. I'll get back to you. No, not you. Not that one. Sorry, I'm just trying to find the lecture. Um, I didn't get back from Barnet until like 20 minutes ago, so. I also have a mentee set up, by the way, in case you need it. Oh, I do. I don't have time to do that either. I've done it, don't I? Okay, so I'm going to be doing some um, gynae, basically. Um, right, can you see the slides? Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to be doing some gynae uh, on um, menopause and... Uh, some incontinent stuff. So the incontinent stuff is applicable to um, urology as well, um, basically. So a bit of both. Okay, so to start off, menopause is the permanent cessation of menstruation. Um, so it's 12 months after the final period. So it's like a retrospective diagnosis because you can't diagnose it until a woman's 12 months after her last period, if that makes sense. Um, and that means perimenopausal is the time from the beginning of the first features of menopause until 12 months after. So, for example, a woman might not have had her period for about six months and you might say she's perimenopausal because it looks like she's going to not have a period for a further six months and be menopausal, but she's not yet menopausal. Um, and it's a clinical diagnosis and it's basically due to a decreased follicular activity due to reduced quantity and quality of eggs. So um, as you will hopefully know that women have a finite number of eggs, whereas men don't have a finite number of sperm. So basically you just run out of eggs, um, which causes reduced estrogen production from the ovaries. And then you get LH and FH rise because there's low estrogen and um, that causes, so there's no negative feedback basically. So the LH and FH, F, FSH rise. And um, basically you get irregular periods and then eventually they stop. And the average age of onset in the UK is 51. So can anyone suggest any symptoms of menopause? And this is quite a common um, history station for an OSCE, is a woman will come in with some of these symptoms and you've got to talk to her about 
take a history and find out what's going on um or you have to um she might come in asking about hrt which we'll come on to in a bit um so it's this is menopause is quite a good topic to know in terms of oski would you agree anish yeah uh, like i think i think hrt counseling is also like something that is quite neglected in the curriculum i don't know whether they'd ask it in an oski because it is neglected but i think it is quite important considering like a lot of people go on to do gp jobs and things like that it's something that could come up in a more integrated station is like talking to one about HRT or something like that. Because yeah. there's a lot of, we'll go on to the side effects and hopefully you know some of them. Um, so things that people have suggested them. So hot flushes is a, is a big one, mood changes, insomnia, uh, vaginal dryness, urogenital symptoms, that kind of thing. So the, I kind of group them together. Um, so you can have persistent um, or irregular periods, basically. And you can get psychological symptoms, which are like mood changes, um, low mood, irregularity, sorry irritability crying um poor um memory and sleep disturbance and quite often the psychological symptoms are the things that present first so the woman might still be having her periods but they might be getting much lighter and then she'll start to have some of these psychological symptoms and you can get vasomotor symptoms like hot flushes and night sweats palpitations headaches dizziness um and those are due to um the um pulsatile lh which kind of has an effect on temperature um and that's because the um, LH, is, you release a lot more of it because of the negative feedback. Then you get urogenital symptoms, which a lot of them you guys mentioned. So this is things like, um, well, you can see them there, atrophic vaginitis, dryness, itching, dyspareunia, prolapse, frequency, um, dysuria, um, urgency, and then recurrent UTIs. And these are basically due to the lack of estrogen because estrogen helps maintain like um, the vagina, the bladder, and the uterus. And because there's a lack of it, you get basically atrophy of all of those areas. Um, and then other symptoms like skin thinning, hair loss, and brittle nails. Okay, so this is a lady who has come in with, um, she is 53 and has um, been recently experiencing hot flushes and night sweats. She's also getting some headaches and having trouble sleeping. Her last period was seven months ago and she's never had any surgery. So what would you like to give for her symptoms? And can anyone tell me why the surgery comment is relevant? The menti should still be working. I'll post the code again in case anyone closed it. Um, I mean, I can't see the menti, so you, you need to tell me what the... Yeah, I'll read out. Okay. Yes. So people are saying that there's so no surgery is relevant because um, she has a womb still, which is important, which does not, obviously not have a, a hysterectomy. Right, Alicia, let me know when enough people have answered. Uh, the voting just closed itself. I don't know why. Sorry, it's open again. You can have 30 seconds. Okay, so 24 people have gone for E, one has gone for C. Okay, so the important things for this is hot flushes and night sweats, as we discussed, they're symptoms of menopause. And her last period was seven months ago, so she's perimenopausal. Um, and because of this, you will give cyclical um, estrogen and progesterone. So you don't give continuous and you only give continuous if their last period was more than a year ago. And there's a couple of other features, but I'll come on to that in a second. Um, and you don't just give topical estrogen because she still has a uterus. So you can't give that alone. Does that make sense to everyone? So we'll go through the continuous um, versus cyclical in a second. But it's good that you all realise that you would give estrogen and progesterone. So the management of HRT. There are loads of different features that you can look at. Sorry, the management of menopause. The main one is HRT, but there are lots of other steps that you can do. So conservative management, this works for some women if they don't want to take medication. So things like stopping smoking, exercising, healthy eating, avoiding alcohol and caffeine, because obviously they can have an effect on your temperature control um, and influence hot sweats and that kind of thing, and anxiety, um, which are common features of menopause. Um, weight loss and then reducing stress and sleep hygiene can all help with um, things like the night sweats and the hot flushes. You can try alternative therapies, so acupuncture and like primrose oil. 
Um, and then contraception. So it is important to counsel women that they still need contraception. So if they're um, 12 months, they need, if they're under 50, over 50, they only need it for 12 months. If they're under 50, they need contraception for two, two years after their last period. Does that make sense? So contraception is a big one that lots of people forget about, um, but it's quite important. Because although they're mo most of their cycles are anovulatory, you can get a couple of ovulatory cycles like scattered in. Then HRT and then bone protection is important because without oestrogen, you are at risk of osteoporosis. So most women are advised to take um, calcium and vitamin D supplements. And then there are other things that you can do. So if they've got no other symptoms apart from um, urogenital atrophy, you can just give topical oestrogen. So that can be like a ring or a pessary. Um, and if they have hot flushes and nothing else and they don't want to take HRT, um, you can try like SSRIs or SNRIs. So you can give proxetine as well. Okay, so HRT is, contains oestrogen, which basically replaces what the ovaries no longer make. And if a woman has a uterus, you've got to give progesterone as well. Um, so anaposed oestrogen increases the risk of endometrial hyperplasia and carcinomas, as some people said in the comments. Um, so that is why you've got to give the progesterone. So the woman without a uterus can just have oestrogen, but if you have a uterus, you need both. And the treatment length depends on the woman. So they usually arise between five and seven years, um, but there's no like fixed time that someone has to stop by. So it's completely up to the woman because they, they are, if they want to weigh up the risks and the benefits of taking it versus the symptoms they're getting. So oestrogen can be given as a patch, cream, gel, orally, buccal, nasal spray, subdermal or vaginal ring. I know it seems really dumb to put that on, but I'm pretty sure that was a question in our finals. Was how can you give HRT oestrogen? Progesterone can be given as orally or a patch, or you can give it as um, like a, a marina coil. So someone has asked here, so can topical oestrogen only be given um, only be given if the only symptoms of vaginal dryness if the woman has a womb? So you would give it, um, the topical oestrogen is it's only local and it literally goes into the vagina rather than affecting the uterus. So you can give it in those situations. Um, and it's, you give it as like a vaginal cream or a vaginal pressery, which only really affects the uterus. And it's relatively low dose that you give. So yes, you could. Um, it's one of the things that you can also give. For, so you can give it for women with... Um, with incontinence, which we'll come on to in a minute, um, as you can give um, oestrogen topically then. Another person is asking, is there a minimum amount of time that women should be on HRT? Or is it their advice to be on it for at least a year, but otherwise not? So um, women who have um, premature ovarian insufficiency are advised to be on it until the age of 50, which we'll come on to in a second. Um, it's completely up to the woman. So some women will not want to take HRT. Um, and usually the symptoms, I think, of um, menopause stop around seven years after you get after menopause starts. Um, so that's why they advise like five to seven years, because usually by seven years, your symptoms should have stopped. Um, so it's completely dependent. So it's completely dependent how you um, how long. Um, I don't know if there's a minimum amount of time, but like someone might take it and not like it. And then therefore they might just deal with the symptoms, if that makes sense. But it's not like a, women aren't forced to take HRT and therefore there's no minimum amount of time you have to take it for. Um, so progesterone, as I said, can be given in these forms. So a patch and orally or um, like a coil. Um, and then combined therapy is where you use both. So you can use oestrogen and progesterone in any of these forms. So quite a lot of time if you're giving both, you might just give them orally or as patches because it's easier but a woman could have a coil um, and then you give it like oestrogen in any of the other forms. So they're perimenopausal. So their last period was less than a year ago. You need cyclical. So you have oestrogen every day and progesterone is taken on day between day 12, on the last 12 days, sorry. And that basically causes bleeding and you want the cyclical bleeding um, until they're a year postpart, until they're a year postmenopausal. Um, if they're postmenopausal, so year, their last period was over a year ago or they're over the age of 54, um, or they've been on cyclical HRT for one year, then you give continuous combined. So they just take the same amount of progesterone and the same amount of oestrogen every day. And that's it. Right. Sorry, someone else asked another comment. Regarding the um, coil, if a woman is given the marina and the oestrogen, is it considered continuous? Since progesterone is, yes, it would be continuous. So sometimes they will do that. If a, so if a woman, for example, has a coil and then you think she's postpart, like postmenopausal, but she's not yet a year, because she's got the coil in, you're not going to take the coil out and give her something else because coils are obviously very effective contraception. Um, but if they're not yet 
um, post, if they're not yet like a year post, you might not advise the coil, you'd advise a different form of contraception and then a different form of estrogen. Oh, sorry, a different form of progesterone. Does that make sense? So you wouldn't take, if a woman had it in, you wouldn't take it out. Um, you would, they would just be having combined. You wouldn't take it out if a woman had it in. But if she didn't have any, like if she didn't have a coil in and you were debating how to give the progesterone, I, you wouldn't go for a coil to start with. You might go for patches and then say, when you're in like six months time, when you're a year post, come back and we can give you the coil. Does that make sense? Okay, we're on to the next SPF. If that doesn't make sense, please let me know. Um, yeah, if they've got an IUS, you wouldn't take it out because it's such an effective form of contraception. Um, and also it can be difficult to tell with coils how often, if they're getting, like the periods when they're getting and that kind of thing. So the next question is the same lady from before. She has started on appropriate HRT, which we all discussed. What are the most um, important risks of the treatment. So Anish, can you open the minty please? Anish. Oh, thank you, sorry. Right, so I'll give you a couple of seconds if you could answer it, 30 seconds. Okay, Anish, what answer have people gone with? Most people went for D, but there was a bit of a split between the others. A few went for each other, each of the others as well. Okay. So the important things in this question is she's on HRT. So we just need to know about the side effects of HRT and what is most important. So osteoporosis is not a um, side effect, it is a benefit. It, is a, it reduces the chance of osteoporosis. So without taking HRT, you're at risk of osteoporosis. Endometrial cancer is a risk of estrogen alone. Colorectal cancer, HRT actually reduces the risk of colorectal cancer. Um, so breast and endometrial. Because she's taking, as we discussed, combi combined, because she still has the uterus, she's at risk of breast and endometrial cancer um, because progesterone increases the risk of the breast cancer and estrogen increases the risk of the endometrial cancer. And then hypertension is a risk factor of HRT, but there's like a small, it's much it's not as serious as cancer and there's quite a small chance of it. It's more at risk if you already have hypertension, it's likely to exacerbate your hypertension as opposed to cause hypertension. Okay, so the benefits of HRT are it reduces the symptoms, which is obviously the main benefit and that's why we give it to women. Um, it also reduces the risk of osteoporosis, colorectal cancer and heart disease, although the, there's kind of research going into heart disease and there's not we're not certain on the evidence or not. Um, then the risks are breast cancer, which is a risk of combined HRT. So the risk is inc basically increases when you add the progesterone in. Um, ovarian cancer, endometrial cancer, which is a risk factor of estrogen only, and then um, strokes, um, clots, and gallbladder disease. No idea why gallbladder disease is there, but apparently it does. Contraindications. So if you have endometrial cancer, you will not be given it. If you have liver disease, um, because um, most HRT is like metabolized in the liver, so you can give some of the HRT topically um, if they have liver disease, but it depends and I don't need to know about that. And then inherited thrombophilia because obviously it increases the risk of VTE. Um, and then relative risks are hypertension, uh, having a previous or family history of VTE and breast cancer. So in these situations, if you've had previous VTE, you can often give it topically and that decreases the risk of a blood clot. Um, someone has asked, why does progesterone increase breast cancer? Was so generic, so and I'm not actually sure why Anoush, do you know why? But basically, it's the risk. The risk. The risk when you add the progesterone in, it doesn't increase the breast cancer. The risk of breast cancer as much as in as the estrogen in, increases the risk of endometrial cancer. So the risk of endometrial cancer with estrogen alone is really high. When you add the progesterone in to to decrease the risk of endometrial cancer, the risk of breast cancer increases, but not as much as the risk of endometrial cancer with estrogen alone. 
I, I I think yeah. I think progesterone like increases the proliferation of cells in breast tissue, which like obviously if you have increased cell turnover, you, you'll have a slightly increased risk of like point mutations. So I think I think that's why there is an increased risk of breast cancer with progesterone. I can't, I don't know the exact like like fizz, but I think it's something to do with that. Someone asked why. So the the command oral contraceptive pill increases the risk of breast cancer and cervical cancer. I think it increases the risk of cervical cancer because it increases um, something to do with increasing the risk of STIs as opposed to actually increasing the risk of cervical cancer. If that makes sense. And not SDIs, but increase the risk of unprotected sex, and therefore you can get, um, and therefore you can get, um, like you're more at risk of getting HPV. But I don't actually know. Um, and then the endometrial cancer is basically it's, so it's the estrogen alone that increases the risk of the endometrial cancer, and the combined pill you never give est the estrogen is never given alone. It's either you give combined, which is estrogen and progesterone, or you give, um, or you give progesterone. Does that make sense? But so, so basic right. So HRT gives actual estrogen. So the estrogen that you give is the same as the estrogen that your body produces, um, but it's just made outside the body. The oestrogen in the combined pill is a synthetic oestrogen and it's a slightly different molecular format. So that's why they have slightly different side effects. So the oestrogen in the body, the oestrogen given by HRT is exactly the same as the oestrogen that your um, that your body produces. So it causes that. So that's why it causes those effects. And the oestrogen from um, the pill is slightly different. So it causes different effects. Does that make sense? So they contain slightly different things, which is why they cause slightly different effects. And that's why HRT increases the risk of endometrial cancer. Uh, you don't need to know it in that much detail. You just need to learn the side effects and know that HRT does increase the risk of endometrial cancer. Um, migraine with an aura. I'm not actually sure if it's a contraindication. Anush, do you know? Not off the top of my head, I'll check. I, I don't remember ever being focus, taught that it was, right. but that is a good point. I, but I don't remember ever being taught that it was a contraindication. Right, if any of those questions I haven't answered, please let me know. Yeah, I didn't think it was a contraindication. Um, it's not, I think, and I think it's not a contraindication because it's to do with the fact that it's, the estrogen is the same as the estrogen that your body produces and therefore it does, it hasn't been shown to increase the risk of like to exacerbate migraines. Okay, so the next thing, and then we're going to go on to incontinence, is um, so Julie is a 38 year old woman who's recently experiencing hot flashes, which she says affecting her are affecting her daily life. On questioning, her last period was 11 months ago, and she finished treatment for breast um, and she has finished treatment for breast cancer. So she had a mastectomy and chemotherapy two years ago. She's wondering if there's anything that can be done for her symptoms. So what tests do you want to do? What treatment do you want to offer her? And what could the cause be? So if anyone pops their comments in the, their thoughts in the comments. So we want to measure her. So what do we think she has, first of all? Let's ask that first. Yeah, she's got premature ovarian insufficiency. And you want to check her FSH levels. So you only test this one. You in, um, in, in a woman who's like around 50, you would never test this. If they've got symptoms of menopause, it's a clinical diagnosis. If they're a bit younger, you might want to look at it. Um, and you check the FSH, and if it's above 30, it indicates menopause. Um, and basically increasing levels suggest um, fewer eggs in the ovaries, effectively. Um, and the treatment that we want to give her is cyclical HRT. We want to give her calcium and vitamin D because she is at risk of um, osteoporosis. Um, and then the cause of it. 
So can you give HRT on breast cancer? You might, she, she, because she's been treated with a mastectomy and chemotherapy, you might not, you, that's a valid point actually, I don't know. Probably should check that. So, you would probably want to avoid hormonal HRT. So prem, we'll just go through premature ovarian and failure. So as I said before, it's the onset of menaces or cessation of menaces for more than a year and you have high gonadotrophin levels and it's before the age of 40. I say it is it's a relative contraindication so it would be a it would be a discussion with the team. Uh, it's a relative contraindication the HRT so it would be a discussion with the team and you'd want to work out what to give her. Um, so the FSH levels, depending on how high they were and the symptoms. So if they were super high and she definitely had symptoms, you probably wouldn't do it again. If they were like borderline, you could do it like two or three months apart to check and see if they're still high. Does that make sense? So the different different rentals that you can have for it are um, PCOS, anorexia, um, stress, hypothyroid, hyperprolactinemia, Sheehan syndrome and Asherman syndrome. And then the causes of it are idiopathic. So um, idiopathic is like the most common cause, and then you can get um, chromosomal abnormalities. You can also have autoimmune diseases like hyperthyroid Addison's disease, myasthenia gravis, um, endometrial insufficient uh, defic deficiencies. Sorry, enzyme deficiencies, and then iatrogenic. So this is things like um, radiotherapy, chemotherapy, um, and that doesn't have to. That can be for like, any type of cancer. It could have been something that they had in childhood, for example. Um, and then taking away the ovaries, which is not as common now. That's more, that would be a treatment for something else, which you'd obviously realise that you'd done. Um, so in premature ovarian failure, the um, FSH level is above 30. The LH level will also be elevated, but FH, LH level, sorry, but you don't really measure that. You usually just measure FSH. The estroid is also low and the antimurin hormone is low as well. Does anyone know what antimurin hormone like relates to? So yeah, antimurin hormone is the level of um, it's the level of eggs that a woman's got, and it relates to the like over how much they have, um, and it's usually stable in the menstrual cycle, and then it starts to like drop as the woman like gets less and less eggs. So it's as someone has asked, would you screen for different causes? So in this woman, she um, has clear symptoms, so she's got a clear cause. So you, it's clearly probably due to the fact that she's got she's had chemotherapy. Um, if a woman you're not really sure about, so she's got like a vague, vague history and you're not sure why, then you would screen for other causes. So you could do simple blood tests to look for thyroid disease and Addison's and that kind of thing. And if that's not clear, then you could go and look at other stuff. Um, so if you weren't sure, then you would do um, blood testing. But if you were sure, you would just treat straight away, if that makes sense. Thank you to the people who've written that out. Um, and then basically it's due to reduced um, development, reduced follicular development, or there's increased um, like atresia of the follicles. And it can be reversible. So in some women, for example, a woman like hyperthyroidism, you, you may be able to reverse it. But in a woman who's had like chemotherapy, it won't be reversible. Um, so you may, women may spontaneously like go back to a varying activity, but it's very dependent. Um, so they may get like a small, they may get some bleeds where they release eggs and therefore there's a small chance that they could get pregnant. So the management is generally HRT. So you do need it for quite a few years because you've got, you need bone protection in these women. Um, then you also need bone protection. So calcium, vitamin D, and depending on the age, they might, ha they might have bisphosphonates, but you would probably do like Dexter scans and then someone else would be involved in that decision. And if they do desire pregnancy, um, then you need to basically, donor eggs need to be used and then you can do um, embryo transfer. Okay, so the next one is a lady who's Jill who is 62. She's experiencing episodes where she accidentally leaks urine um, and that's been going on for a few years but it's been getting worse. She explains that she feels the need to go to the toilet and then must go straight away and she cannot um, always hold it in. She went through menopause eight years ago and has had three children all born vaginally. So what investigations do you want to do and uh, what do you want to rule out? Mm -hmm. So we want to do a urine dip and then MSC and what, we, what, what are we looking for in the urine dip?
to exclude the UTI, what else are we looking for in the urine dip? You want to do a bladder diary. So on the urine dip, you'd also want to look for glucose. Um, yeah, diabetes. So look for glucose levels um, to look for any signs of diabetes. Um, and then you also do a vaginal examination, yep, and you would look for prolapse as well as that, because that could have something to do with it. So, we want to do bladder diary, urine dip, blood glucose levels, um, and then the, what do you want to rule out? I've got a slide on that in a second, so I'll just go through it then. So there are two main different types of incontinence. Um, this is applicable to obviously men and women, but incontinence generally is more common in women um, because of their anatomy. So there's stress incontinence, um, which is when basically you have involuntary leakage of urine during increased intra-abdominal pressure in the absence of detrusive contractions. Um, so normally when the abdominal pressure increases, the bladder neck and the pelvic floor muscles can counteract it. Um, but then in these situations, um, the bladder neck and the pelvic floor um, and the urethral sphincter are weakened, so they can't overcome the, force, the like pressure in the abdomen. Um, so basically that's why you get incontinence, because you're can't, it, the pressure is too great and the, basically the abdominal pressure is too great and it's the most common type. Risk factors are obesity and like a chronic cough, um, pelvic surgery or prolapse, having increased parity, so especially vaginal deliveries and episiotomies just because they damage like the muscles and the tissue around the area more. Um, estrogen deficient state, so being placed menopausal is also a risk factor because as I said before, um, estrogen helps maintain um, all of that area, so there's um, a, normally atrophy of the area when estrogen levels decrease. And then urge incontinence. Um, is involuntary leakage of urine accompanied or immediately preceded by urgency and it's usually due to an overactive bladder um, which is basically when you have uncontrolled involuntary juicer muscle spasm even when the bladder volume is low or not full so the spasms basically overcome the signals um, they're, over, they're stronger than the sphincter strength um, and that's why you get leakage and the bladder just spasms at random times so usually what happens is your brain tells your bladder you need to pee because the bladder's full and then your bladder, the trusor muscle contracts. In this situation, the trusor muscle just contracts on its own at random times. So you might end up needing, feeling like you need to pee when your bladder's not full. And it can also be due to neurological conditions, so like MS, spina bifida, um, and then stroke or spinal cord damage. Okay, so can anyone suggest any of the different symptoms? Or, well, what's the different symptoms of urge and in, um, urge and stress incontinence? We won't go through those, we'll go, I'll just go through it. And then the investigations, you guys already listed some of the ones you want to do. So stress incontinence, usually get involuntary leakage of urine, like coughing, sneezing, exertion. Um, so women might get like incontinence when they stand up, or um, that kind of thing. And usually it's a very small volume. Urge incontinence, you can remember it as like fun. So you can get frequency, urgency, nocturia, and then sometimes you can get incontinence. So not everyone with urge will get incontinence, um, but most women will get incontinence with it, or, and men. So you want to do a bladder diary. In stress incontinence, you'll have normal frequency and bladder capacity. And in urge incontinence, you'll have high frequency and you'll have small volumes of urination. So they'll just go to the toilet quite a lot because the bladder just randomly contracts. So they'll have, um, they'll go more times in the day generally and they'll have small volumes every time they go. And then you can do a urodynamic study, which is basically where you measure the pressure in um, the abdomen and the pressure in the urethra. Um, and then you work out how the pressure changes when the bladder's really full, as the bladder's filling up, and when they empty. And then you get them to do things like coughing and seeing if there is um, any leakage of urine. So in um, stress incontinence, you'll have leakage will occur with coughing, and there'll be no detrusor contraction. It will, they'll just um, have leakage of urine. But in urge, you'll have involuntary detrusor contractions, and that will cause the leakage of urine. So. The differential diagnoses, you kind of suggested some already. So I kind of grouped them into this. And this is important to think about in SPAs when you're like, when they've got symptoms of it and it might ask like, what else do you want to rule out? What else do you need to do? What else could be the cause? So um, endocrine causes, so like um, atopic vaginitis, which is just due to decreased estrogen. Um, diabetes, like a urine dip, um, and blood glucose can show that. And then infection, so UTI, you do a urine dip to look at that. Um, obstruction, so you, that could be um, like a, card, um, a bladder cancer, it could be prolapse or um, urinary tract obstruction, um, and then also psychological causes. So some people might just feel like they need to go to the toilet and then go a lot. Yeah, as Anusha is saying, so people are asking if urodynamic studies are performed routinely. They are not routine, no. They are generally, if it's complex, 
Um, if you're trying stuff and it's not working, you might be like, oh, have we definitely got the right type of incontinence? Let's look into it. Or if it's like a mixed picture and you want to work out if it is definitely a mixed picture, um, but it's not routinely done, but they give like the definitive diagnosis, if that makes sense. So generally, it's, as um, you said in it, it's normally if it's refractory or complex, they will be done. OK, then. So this is um, Yasmin, she is 68 and she's been experiencing issues where she needs to wee. She explains that sometimes she, it's, she suddenly feels like she needs to urinate and often has incidences where she cannot make it to the toilet in time. She has no issues um, when coughing or sneezing and her recent urine dip was negative. So she is unsure what is causing the problem. What is the most appropriate treatment? So mostly, firstly, which type of incontinence do we think she has? And then, Anish, if you could open the minute and the, if you guys could vote in there. They have 45 seconds or so. OK. How are we doing? So vast majority went for E and then uh, a scattering for A, B and D. Okay, so the things that are important here are she um, often needs to urinate and can't make it to the toilet in time. So as um, Chrissy has said, it sounds like urge incontinence. So the first step in management for urge incontinence is six weeks of bladder retraining. So we'll go through the management of each of them now. So for stress incontinence, what is the first thing you do? So if you, you wouldn't start with a diary. A diary is like how you diagnose it you would um, start with, once you've diagnosed it, you start the management, which would be conservative things. So that lifestyle, so weight loss. If a woman is very overweight, um, that can contribute to the abdominal pressure, which can obviously make it worse in her symptoms of stress incontinence. So weight loss is a big thing to advise. Um, and then you would also advise on reducing fluid intake, caffeine and alcohol. So for example, if she, um, alcohol and caffeine are bad, so women should, have, and men should avoid those if they are getting signs of incontinence, regardless of the type of incontinence. And then the other thing that you would do, as you guys have all said, is um, pelvic floor muscle training. So this is like supervised by a specialist and you need eight contractions three times a day, for three months. Um, and then you can treat any conditions raising abdominal pressure. So say she's got a cough, um, you can try and look into the cough. If that's if you cough every time she coughs that she pees, then you need to look into that. The next thing you would do is so the next procedure, the ne next step is actually surgical management. So if pelvic floor retraining has not worked, you would go to surgical management. And this is like tapes and sling procedures. You don't need to know that, what they are. You just need to know you go to surgical management. If a woman doesn't want surgical management because it's quite extreme, saying okay, we've tried. Pelvic floor retraining, that's not work, let's go to surgery. You can do medical management. This is less successful. Um, so there are three different drugs that you can give there. So duloxetine is an antidepressant, um, and then these other two, which I can't say. And then you can also give topical estrogen. So if a woman is postmenopausal, you can try topical estrogen. And as we said before, because it's topical, so it's either like a pessary or it's cream in the vagina, it doesn't increase the risk of endometrial cancer, but it helps kind of, um, it can help the vagina and the bladder um, and hopefully reduce the chance their incontinence. So urge incontinence, the first line management for this is conservative measures. So that's lifestyle changes like we discussed before and then bladder retraining. And this is like a six week programme. And basically the idea is that the woman and the man needs to, to like you have control voiding. So like they need to go to the toilet, but they don't go yet. And you kind of wait until certain intervals. So like you don't, it's like, for example, when a woman sees a toilet, Rather than just going to the loo, you should say, oh, wait an hour and then try and go. And it's trying to train your bladder and your mus the trusa muscle not to keep contracting all the time. If that doesn't work, you can try anticholinergics. So this is like oxybutynin, um, toltalidine and other ones that you can give. Um, so oxybutynin is usually the first sign option. And what you do is you give it for one month. And if it works, then you can give it for two more. 
Um, if it doesn't work, you stop it. So generally that you do try like a three month course and take them off it and see what happens. Um, and this um, suppresses the detrusor activity because it blocks the anticholinergic receptors um, and relaxes the bladder wall. Um, but it's got many side effects that you guys should look at because it's an anticholinergic drug. So in old people, you don't you'd be cautious about giving anticholinergics um, because of the side effect, their side effect profile. And as I said here, you can also try topical estrogen if the woman wants to. So in old people, you would try um, Mirabegron because it doesn't it is not not anticholinergic so if someone's older like in their 80s you might want to try um this rather than giving the anticholinergic just because it's got the side effects are better um for an older person and then you can try other things which are like super specialist um like neuromodulation and sacral nerve stimulation so you can try like continuously stimulating the s3 nerve root which will hopefully suppress the detrusor contraction and then you can also oh sorry you can also try um, giving the botulinum toxin injection into the trusor muscle, which kind of blocks neuromuscular transmission. But this can cause retention um, because their muscle, like the detrusor, then can't contract at all. So some people with this will end up having to like self catheterize. So it's like a super niche thing that you don't really need to know about. So that is all we were going to do today. I have got some slides on prolapse. But prolapse is super boring. Um, so I'll just put them on the, the lecture slides on the Google Drive thing, Anoush. Um, and if you guys want to look at prolapse, you can go through it then. But in um, women with incontinence, you often get prolapse and incontinence at the same time. So it's something to be aware of. Um, if you are asking a history, um, if you're doing a history and a woman has signs of prolapse, you want to ask about incontinence. Or if she's got incontinence, you want to ask about prolapse, because quite often the prolapse can be like contributing to the incontinence. Um, so has anyone got any questions? And I know there was quite a lot of confusion earlier about like the HRT stuff. So if anyone's got any questions on that, that me and I can try answer them again. But it's very confusing the different like difference between the the pill and HRT. Um, you don't really need to know why there's a difference. You just need to know what side effects each one causes and recognise that they are different. And it's mainly due to the fact that the oestrogen is slightly different because one is the same as endogenous oestrogen and one is like a synthetic, slightly different oestrogen. I remember like reading into this when it was mentioned in a lecture and then giving up around 20 minutes later because I just like it didn't really make that much sense. It's super confusing. I don't think they really know why there's a difference, but there is a difference and just know which one causes which one. So I thought that if if you have if so if you have a history of VT, it, dep it obviously depends. Like, was it provoked VT? Had you just had a hip replacement, and therefore it was likely due to the hip replacement that you had the VT, and therefore giving HRT probably wouldn't increase your risk like that much. Um, but it very much depends. So as I said before, you can give topical HRT doesn't have the same risk of um, VTEs as like oral medication so for example if a woman had has had a previous um vte and she does really really want hrt and she had like a provoked hrt uh, sorry a provoked vte then you could give her topical therapy and it probably would be okay um but as so it's obviously gps normally prescribe this you, you as a gp you may refer her to gynae um and they look into it but you can it is it's like I wouldn't say it's an absolute, it's like a contraindication, um, maybe not absolute, it's a contraindication, you'd have to look at that, if that makes sense. I think like in a, in a lot of gynae, like remember that like, like all of, all of this is like a discourse between like the patient and the doctor and they'll come to like some kind of compromise where like what is treat, whatever it needs to be treated is adequately treated, but it also doesn't cause like a huge like inconvenience going forward in terms of health so like it's all like a balance because like ultimately like everything has like disadvantages especially in terms of hormonal treatments so for example if a woman's had like two v two pe's you're not even topical hrt you probably wouldn't give her you would try other things for her symptoms so you could try like an ssri she's got no contraindications to that and you'd give brain protection like vitamin d and um, phosphates uh, sorry, vitamin D and calcium and maybe considered as phosphonates if you really needed it. But you probably wouldn't give HRT if she'd had like two PEs and they were, they were unprovoked, for example. But if she's had like one provoked PE, 
and it was like 20 years ago and you could definitely know the cause of it you could try topical for example but it would not that would not be your decision you'll be referring on to someone else to make that their mind up And as Anoush said about drugs, uh, no, you don't need to know like specific ones. You just need to know generally. Um, but there are certain like so anticholinergics. I would definitely learn the side effects of those because that's quite a common, especially in terms of um, Jerry's. That's quite a like a common thing to come up and get asked about. Okay, I'm going to go and have dinner. Have a nice evening, Jess. You too, Anish. Four hours late. No worries. <laughs>